The heavens proclaim the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims the work of his hands. Good evening. My name is Father Timothy Sepe, and I'm a parish priest of the Diocese of Peoria with two small parishes of Westville and Georgetown, Illinois. On behalf of my parish, St. Mary's Parish, I welcome you to all. In 2015, I was blessed to be a part of a special outreach of the Vatican Observatory Foundation. They had invited Catholic priests, deacons, and religious educators to Tucson, Arizona, Arizona for a five-day workshop on astronomy. At that time, I asked Brother Guy, Consomagno, if he would be a speaker at a priest retreat for the upcoming 2017 solar eclipse. And he said, I'm sorry, I'm already booked. And without missing a beat, I said, how about 2024? <laughs> And he said, if I'm around, okay. <laughs> well, Brother Guy, welcome to Mother of the Redeemer Retreat Center. Okay, Bloomington, Illinois, okay, okay. <laughs> and before I introduce uh, the Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Thompson for our opening prayer, I need to introduce uh, our guest house manager, Maggie Garst. Maggie, please. <laughs> I had met Maggie before, please come on, and I had done uh, some priest retreats here in the early teens, and so I had knew Maggie then, and when I was thinking about 2024, it was a year 2019, and I was thinking to myself, I wonder where the path of totality goes. <laughs> I just, I knew it went through Carbondale, and it went to the northeast, I said, well, I'll just play around on the internet. And I saw it when it go across southern Indiana. I said, oh, I know a retreat center down there. And so I started looking at the coordinates, and I said I couldn't believe it. And so in 2019, I called her and asked to book the retreat center. And she was understandably confused. <laughs> <laughs> and finally said, we don't book out that far in advance. So at this time, I want to introduce Maggie Garst, our manager. So. Well, welcome, all of you. I know I've met most of you at the, at the office, so. But uh, my name is Maggie Garst. I, uh, not managing, but I oversee the guest house. To me, the manager is the Blessed Mother. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the plain and simple. We're just the little instruments. Get her a shirt, too, then. Okay. <laughs> If you can find, well, no, she's here. She's, I know she's here somewhere. <clears throat> but anyway, on behalf of Mary's children, the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate, and all of our volunteers, uh, we want to welcome you, Archbishop Thompson, and, and all of you to our retreat center, Mother of the Redeemer Retreat Center. Um, and especially for the, this being the center of this major celestial event. Uh, Father Supe has been anxiously <clears throat> waiting for this particular eclipse for quite some time. I still have my notes um, from the date of July 15th, because I keep a phone log. July 15th of 20, 2019, when Father called me and to say he wanted to sponsor a retreat here for the upcoming solar eclipse on the 8th of April of 2024, <clears throat> I thought to myself, okay, never thinking it would come to pass, but here we are, <laughs> here we are. So I want all of you, just besides listening to all of our speakers, Brother Guy, uh, Dr. Christopher, uh, Dr. Jeff, and all those, uh, Brenda, Dr. Brenda, and uh, those who aren't here yet, maybe, uh, to enjoy the retreat grounds. This, these, this is holy ground. A message from Our Lady saying, this is a place of peace and prayer, and believe it, it is. So enjoy walking the rosary path, the station of the cross, the path at the top of the hill that has the seven sorrows of Our Lady, and attending the services in the Sacred Heart Chapel according to your schedule with the, the, the French friars having the Saturday and Sunday Divine Mercy uh, services. And 
uh, visit the bookstore. And we found, and basically, uh, Bill and Marianne decided to essentially not have uh, the bookstore open for general public because of parking and all this, this kind of thing. So on Saturday, tomorrow, from 4.30 to 6 p.m. and 7 to 8 p.m., Andre is well, good enough to uh, have the store open for that time for just the retreatants. And it is a very nice bookstore, so you'll have to go in and see it. And just so you, if you haven't looked at your little slip, the Wi-Fi passcode is Mary's Children. Low case, no apostrophes, Mary's Children. But just know we are very low, so it just depends on where you're standing and stuff that you can be able to get it. Um, I just want to mention about the healing water from the farm that I have some in the office and we just appreciate a free will offering um, because it does take time to pump and to, uh, to put you know, in the bottles and everything. So we just appreciate um, you know, a little donation. And as Our Lady said, or, or Jesus said, use the water to bless, ingest, and bathe with it. And there are, you know, because we have had healings from, and it all depends on what God's, what's God's desire for everybody anyway. So, but if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask any of us. Sarah, Dave, um, Doug, Andre's out, still out at the road. Uh, but don't hesitate to ask if you have any questions and stuff, because I've been here almost a little over 20 years, so everything keeps coming up, cropping up with questions. So thank you. Uh, let's go. Uh, also mention Sarah Chambers is in the back there. She's Maggie's right hand lady here. And okay. A couple of other items. Um, at the very end, if you could help out with putting your sheets and pillowcases in inside the pillowcase and leave them out. And you got the guest code. And there is no food. Here, okay? No food is allowed here, right, Maggie? That's right. Pay attention. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I got you a, some uh, mud pies, okay? This is over in the annex, okay? And some sun chips. <laughs> sun chips. And uh, so I, um, I actually, Bishop, Archbishop, I actually contacted the local brewery here because it is Sun King's Brewery. And I said, well, wouldn't it be made, I think it's called Cur Curvet, to make a special brewing around an event. And I said, well, wouldn't it be great to have their own uh, you know, brand of beer just for the solar eclipse? And this is, a, um, my background is in marketing, okay? So, <laughs> <laughs> well, then I, I looked at a Sun King label and I, I did some research, Archbishop, and it's uh, an Aztec god. And so, <laughs> and so I said, okay, I don't think this is going to work. So, um, but Maggie, you can take that for me. Yes. And is there anything else you can think of? You said about the how to get up on top. I just have to say, Father Supe has pretty much kept on tune with getting everything uh, set up. I, it's just amazing. Just amazing. And so, as I say... Here we are. Okay, you know. very good. Well, thank, thank you, you Meg. Thank you. At this time, I want to invite our canonical pastor, Archbishop Thompson, to, to come and say an opening prayer and say a few words of his own. Thank you, Father Supe. So you're telling me there's no beer tonight? <laughs> Actually, there's no alcohol allowed on the ground. So. Oh. So where's the brewery at? Can we get to that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, it's an honor to have you here. It's an honor to be with you. Um, sorry, I can't stay very long. My, my, um, <clears throat> my first time I was made a pastor, the principal, the first full moon was coming up, and the principal said, oh, it's going to get a little crazy, Father. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, full moons. Kids and parents go nuts at full moons. What are you talking about? I thought she was kidding. It was weird to watch how people get, get weird at full moons. So over time, I've seen that. And the, uh, the last few days have been a little crazy. So if full moons do that, I'm not sure what this solar eclipse is supposed to do. <laughs> but, uh, but last night I, had a, I got a call about 9.10, about 9.15. A 
little crisis I got to deal with, and then uh, something else this morning. And my vicar for clergy is not available. I would go to my vicar general. He's not available. He's out of town. So I thought, well, it's me. So I've got to go back tonight to kind of take care of those things that I would have passed on to other people. So I don't know if that's the solar eclipse or God's just getting even with me. Probably a little bit of both. So, But it's an honor to have you here. Brother Guy, what a great, great gift. Um, Father Supe, th- thank you for all your, his, your enthusiasm is infectious, and just uh, what a great witness to you, so um, just making all this happen, so thank you. Um, as I do the prayer, I just, you know, Laudato, see, I wrote it in the, in the little book there, um, I couldn't get my Wi-Fi working until someone gave me the password, so, because I thought, when he asked me to sign this book, the first thing I thought of was Laudato, see, my favorite line in there is, is number 12, rather than a problem to be solved. The world is a joyful mystery to be contemplated with gladness and praise. Rather than a problem to be solved, the world is a joyful mystery to be contemplated with gladness and praise. And with that is not only the stars and the moon and the sun and the creatures of the fly or swim, or whatever, but that's us too. We each are a joyful mystery, not a problem to be solved. And so as we pray tonight, let's Pray with that same gift of that same sense of awe and wonder um, of all creation and these days of getting ready for this to experience the solar eclipse. Um, but all this that it's about, it's not out there. We're part of it. Um, we're part of all God's creation. And there's that great harmony, um, that balance that happens by, by, by divine grace. And we pray for the grace that we cooperate with that, with that grace rather than take it for granted, or even more importantly, uh, somehow go acting contrary to it, to it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. good and loving God, as we gather here this evening and gather this weekend, and all the people who will be traveling throughout the world, uh, throughout, throughout our country, to these places uh, like Indianapolis and Bloomington and other places to, uh, to have this experience, we pray for the, the safety in all the travels for patience among all the gatherings, for opening of minds and ears, but most especially hearts and minds, to allow your grace to permeate our being as individuals, as families, as communities, as believers of you as the author of all creation. May we seek to glorify you in our words and our deeds. May this time, uh, this awesome wonder this weekend, be one that inspires us to look to creation always to see your hand at work, to see the dignity of every every creature and every human being, the sacredness of all life. We ask your continued blessing upon our our journey of of salvation, our journey of faith, made possible through the passion, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we celebrate this Easter week, the joy of your Son's victory over sin and death for us so that we can continue to revel in the joy of of being part of your creation, being your children, not merely on this earth, but most especially for all eternity. We ask you to continue to guide us and protect us through the intercession of St. Francis of Assisi, that we may continue to, like Mary, be faithful disciples, uh, pondering all things, treasuring all things in our hearts. As we, we ask all this, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop. Before I introduce our keynote speaker and other invited guests, I want to recognize our youngest. I'm not sure if he was here. I was told we would have a two-year-old, and I was asked if that would be okay. I said, sure. I said, I'll I'll get him a book. So I got him Goodnight Mood. (laughs) Okay. So, in fact, I don't know if it's him, but it might be a her. So. She is, okay, she'll be here Sunday. Okay, well, come on up and get the book. And, uh, uh, okay, very good. And what's her name? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Okay, very good. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. 
And I want to reflect now a little bit on the weekend's theme of faith and science. I want to give a hat tip to uh, Pope Benedict XVI, who as cardinal gave a talk in 1985. He was then head of the then called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And he gave a series of talks that have only been recently put into print. The book is called The Divine Project. This book, those talks themselves, would make a wonderful retreat on faith and science. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, that's why I have the book for sale. I bought 15 copies or so. And the annex, uh, I really encourage you to get a copy. Unfortunately, he had to deal with the subject of faith and science as they had contended with one another. So he honestly writes about that contention and the nature of the church. But following my, the following, then, however, is my own observations. It's not from that book or from the Vatican Observatory or from the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. A long time ago, someone asked, what is truth? This question, that question, has been asked countless many times, even before the Roman procurator Pontius Pilate asked it, perhaps rhetorically, of Jesus. Many are asking of that same question today. In fact, in a way, we are born as natural philosophers, natural scientists, little Aristotelians. Okay? In fact, uh, I tell my CCD kids, whenever I talk about Aristotle, they are to clap. And so every once in a while I throw a Aristotle's name in the homily and they clap. Okay. <laughs> so we have to ask ourselves, what the heck is it when we are born? All of a sudden it's new. Sometimes we're born crying, little Aristotelians. Which brings us to a simple definition of science that I learned in seminary from my scripture professor, Father Martin. No, another Father Martin. Okay. <laughs> Father Francis Martin. He says, science measures change. That's all. Anything beyond that is postulation, a series of connected theories that are tried and tested by other scientists that are either confirmed or debunked. Now, of course, science is more than that, hard work, trial and error. But in the end, science measures change. I would like to propose an updated version of that question I started with. So instead of the fundamental, what is truth, we have, what is narrative? What is narrative? What is the narrative? Is the narrative true? In fact, when we look at the opening lines of the book of Genesis, we find the famous dialogue, famous narrative between God, Adam and Eve, and that serpent. It reads in part, The serpent asked the woman, Did God really say that you shall not eat of the trees of the garden? The woman answered the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, you shall not eat or even touch, lest you die. But the serpent said, you certainly will not die. God knows well that when you eat, your eyes will be open and you will be like God's, knowing good and evil. Now, Cardinal Ratzinger points out of the creation, this creation account of Scripture has God saying, or Scripture saying, God said, Ten times. He parallels that to the Ten Commandments. As such, creation begins with a narrative. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God begins then a narrative with us via Adam and Eve. And due to his divine permissive will, he allows Satan to get into the act. I don't know if you know or have seen this newest translation, Archbishop, but there's recent scholarship has uncovered a new scroll at Qumran, and they call it the FDA CDC version. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And at that point in the narrative between Eve and the serpent, it reads, And the serpent said to the woman, God knows well that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, for it is safe and effective. <laughs> we may laugh at that with nervous line, nervous laugh, but why? Because it goes against the official narrative. If there is anything that can come out of the last three to four years is that we have been made aware of the official narrative coming from the triple alliance of governmental medical mandates, big tech, and big pharma. The interconnection is playing itself out now in the U.S. courts as we speak. But to question the official narrative is to be politically incorrect, but shouldn't be scientifically incorrect. For to call into question experimental gene therapy that has been given to three quarters of the world's population should never be scientifically incorrect. It reminds me of the meme of the Phoenix character, Linus. It's a one panel meme. And he's shouting to somebody to his left, questioning science is how you do science. I bring this up because the prime example of needing to get to the narrative correct and to underscore the importance of truth, for just as there had been a historical crisis of faith in a transcendent God deity since the rise of philosophical modernism, so has there now a current crisis of trust in science, or at least in medical science, and in academia. We see this with the using AI now to investigate people's dissertation for plagiarism. In a post-COVID world, people are realizing that medical science or academia may not seem what it says it is. For example, Pfizer argued to a judge to keep its data on the COVID shot sequestered for 75 years. The judge said no. The facade of science is being totally objectively vent a, a total objective venture and pure vocation of intention with no monetary kickback or royalties has come under intense scrutiny. For example, Dr. Fauci and others. So just as the Catholic faith or being a Catholic priest has come under scrutiny these days, last decades, and unfortunately rightly so, so has science, at least in medical science. And so this is my editorializing. I'm making a prediction that what has transpired these last years is akin or analogous to the church's unfortunate Galileo moment. Science in general, medical science in particular, will be forced to a rearguard action in the coming years, having to redefine and purify in their own. But as to a unified field theory, little physics talk, of life, the universe, and everything narrative, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that at the end of time, at the final judgment, everything will be explained. We will know the truth. We will know the true narrative. Do you understand that? Everything, we'll, we'll know everything. But we're here for a happy occasion of solar eclipse. Let's not bicker about who killed who. Monty Python reference, no? Okay. We don't have to choose faith over science or science over faith. We can have both. So a weekend of retreat on faith, on science, is a welcome respite and a prelude to one of nature's most exalted events, a total eclipse of the sun. We are not here to answer the deep questions of faith or the deep issues of science. We are not here to offer an apologetics lesson on evolution or if Adam and Eve had a belly button, <laughs> or if you can baptize a space alien, okay? <laughs> Who would have jurisdiction, by the way? Would that be the Archbishop? <laughs> Orlando, okay. And what's up with the International Ast Astronomical Union's issue with Pluto? Am I right? <laughs> no. <laughs> 
So we're, we're going to leave all that talk outside, okay? <laughs> I envision this weekend as a time of appreciation of God's creation. All 13.8 billion years of it. I envision a time spent with men and women of faith, Christian, Catholic, and Jewish, who in turn, on a daily basis, get their hands deep into the science of things. So as for science, and for these scientists, as for all scientists in general, we must be at once respectful of their craft and patient with their results. For sometimes, they get things wrong, which reminds me of a book. <laughs> when Science Goes Wrong, by Brother Guy and Dr. Chris Graney. So I'm going to have this autographed. Okay. But as for faith, the Catechism of the Catholic Church reads, Faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God and believe all that God has said and revealed to us and that the Holy Church possesses for our belief because he is true itself, truth itself. By faith, man freely commits his entire self to God. For this reason, the believer seeks to know and to do God's will. As my Dominican professors taught, faith is a rational response to God because God is true. Just as hope connects with us to God because God is good. And likewise for love, God is love. One of my cherished memories of a man of faith who loved science comes to me again from seminary. It was a very powerful incident in class by the same Father Francis Martin, as I mentioned above. This would be in the mid-1980s. He was explaining a bit of an insight from a theological physicist and cosmologist, Stephen Hawking. Now, this was a time when there were competing theories on the nature of the universe, whether we lived in a static or steady state, expanding or cyclical or retracting in a cyclical pattern, universe, depending on the mass of dark matter. Back into a, uh, the, the cyclical would be we would go back into a singularity, not unlike how the Big Bang started, an ever recycling universe. Anyhow, Father Martin told a class that Hawking was speculating that if we lived in a retracting cyclical universe, the time itself would reverse. The broken water glass on the floor, would go back up onto the tabletop. Now, when he said this, a number of students laughed. Father Francis Martin stood up straight and looked at those seminarians and said sternly, don't laugh, he's trying to figure it out. I love that story. Hawking and all scientists are trying to figure it out. And that has been the story from the beginning of mankind. Those early Babylonians inscribing several hundred years' worth of lunar and solar observations in cuneiform on clay tablets, they did it because they were trying to figure it out. We follow generation upon generation who have also been trying to figure it out to understand our world, our moon, our sun, our universe. Heck, two more Jesuits have just written a ground paper groundbreaking paper on the nature of black holes. They're trying to figure it out. My friends, let me introduce you to our weekend spe speakers, men and women who have been trying to figure it out. So all ladies first, I'm going to invite Dr. Brenda Fry to come forward, just so she get into, okay. just so people on the streaming can see a face that I have here. You may recognize her from an episode of Nova, as I did in 2015, called The Runaway Universe. Oh, yes, I, I don't have a copy. Is that you know, well, why don't you take that? Uh, no, no, no. No, no, no. I'm I just, thought you were giving it. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is, uh, I, no, that was my, we don't have a VCR anymore, but. No. <laughs> you don't have a copy? Someone might. This, this is your copy. Thank okay, you. okay. Well, don't hear her. Okay. So I met her in 2015 at the workshop that was done in uh, Tucson. And this is what she wrote. Her PhD is at astrophysics from UC Berkeley, after which she traveled east to take on a five-year postdoctoral fellowship at Princeton University, 
She then moved still further east to take on her first faculty position as lecturer in Dublin, Ireland. This was followed by a tenure track professorship of physics at the University of San Francisco before finally being recruited by the University of Arizona, where she is currently a professor of astronomy. She spends most of her time thinking and working with the James Webb Space Telescope data set and on a distant universe. Okay. The James Webb Space Telescope data set on the distant universe. It has never been, she has never been lucky enough to see an eclipse and live and in person until now. And so we hope to have that. <laughs> so I have here something for you. I didn't get all the speakers something, but. Open that up. My brother got me, my brother is here by the way, and my sister-in-law, they came in late. But we, um, he got me into this. The, um, well, these, are, so these are first day issue um, astronomy stamps from Space Telescope. From James Webb Space Telescope. Okay. I, I, in case you want to buy one, one's ten dollars, <laughs> and the other the other is thirty dollars. <laughs> so I said, well, I want to present this to her. And because she's a, she's a movie star, you know, and uh, so we want to give her this. Okay, so thank you very much, Doctor. Okay. After contacting Brother Guy, telling him about my plans for 2024, I called him when I found out where the, re the solar eclipse was coming. I called him in 2019, reminding him of his promise of 2015. Would you be willing to be the keynote speaker in 2024? And he gave me the same answer, if I'm around. <laughs> so here we are, Brother Guy, 2024. Welcome to the retreat center here. But after calling him, I knew I had to call the next speaker. He's the son of one of my parishioners. He's from Westville, graduated from St. Mary's grade school. And he has received a PhD at the University of California, San Diego, held a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California. A father, Dr. Jeff Cookie, come up here, please. Okay. <laughs> that way, this, that way people streaming can, can see. Your, mom, your mom's probably watching, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he held a I'm sorry, postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California, Irvine, Caltech, before moving to Australia. He is currently a professor at the Center of Astrophysics and Supercomputing at the Swinburne University in Melbourne, Australia, and a chief investigator of the Center, why, why is that misspelled? Center, <laughs> center of Excellence for gra gravitational wave discovery. Dr. Cooking studies galaxies, my eyes are going out here, my, uh, studies, studies galaxies and, and explosive deaths of stars called supernovas in the distant universe, as well as gravitational wave events and fast involving extreme explosions. What is that called? RB, uh, oh, okay. He has discovered the most distant supernova known. I'll repeat that. He has discovered the most distant supernova known. <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost my place now. Um, he studies galaxies. Okay, among the many projects he leads, this is a, what he's doing is incredible. And this is just like half of it, isn't it? He coordinates over 100 major telescopes, main, many simultaneously, located on every continent and in space, that operates in radio, infrared, optical, UV, X-ray, and gamma ray, and high energy particles detectors to catch the fastest explosions in the universe. He also started his own subway shop, Then uh, 
when 9-11 happened, he, it was, that, it was, that was it, right? They closed the, the base and the... It was uh, Desert Storm. Oh, Desert Storm, okay. They closed the, ba the, the base to outside vendors, and so he said, I'm going to study astronomy, right? Mostly. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he, he self-taught himself the saxophone, and he is the son of my parishioner, Darla Cookie. And she'll be here tomorrow night with her daughter, his sister, Gina. Dr. Cookie also participated with his team in the groundbreaking discovery of a light source for GW170817. Rolls up the tongue. <laughs> yes. On that August 17th day and following, he controlled 15 or 17? 15. 15 telescopes of the 70 that were looking for the light source of the gravity wave from two neutron stars that collapse, but more on that later. So let's give Dr. Jeff Cookie a nice hand. Okay. Our next speaker is Dr. Chris Graney. Uh, I met, um, I don't think I met you in 2015, but I met him here in 2021. Uh, we met with Maggie and the, and the Friars, and we, wanted to, we went over the grounds, and he gave the thumbs up to have the retreat here. So let's give that. <laughs> He's also, he also works for the uh, foundation workshop in Tucson and is the inspiration, I'm sorry, that's Dr. Je uh, Father James uh, Krasinski who's not here. Okay. Chris Graney is an adjunct speaker, press officer, and author, editor at the Vatican Observatory. For some years now, his research focused on the history of astronomy, especially the late 16th and early 17th centuries. That research has resulted in two scholarly books, setting aside all authority, and the second, Science Against Copernicus in the Age of Galileo. And, mathemat and, and Mathematical uh, Disquisitions, a book of thesis, theses immortalized by Galileo, both published by the University of Notre Dame Press. And edited, he's editor, he edited from, he edited, oh, okay, this is a title, From the Director, Selected Works of Father George Coyne, Jesuit, published by Vatican Observatory in 2021, and is co-author with Brother Guy Casamagno, when science goes wrong, okay? Um, okay, that's the full title. The Desire for Search for Truth, okay? Thank you, Dr. Chris Graney. Okay. Doc? At this time, we'll invite uh, Brother Guy to come up. Brother Guy Casamagno, a Jesuit, is director of the Vatican Observatory, Detroit, a native of Detroit, Michigan. He earned degrees in planetary science from MIT and the University of Arizona. He was a research fellow at Harvard and MIT served in the U.S. Peace Corps, Kenya, taught university physics before entering the Jesuits in 1989. At the Vatican Observatory since 1993, in, 2000, in 2015, Pope Francis appointed Dr. Consomano, director of the Vatican Observatory. Brother Guy's research explores connections between meteorites, asteroids, and the evolution of small solar system bodies, along with more than 250 scientific publications. He is author of a number of books on popular astronomy and the topic of faith, of science, most recently when science goes wrong. So at this time, um, Fra Roderick is going to turn on the projector, and we need 15 seconds. Okay. Just long enough to say of all the outrageous things he said, the one that I will fight to the death is Pluto, which I think the IAU got right. I was there. 
But then, what can I expect from somebody who was educated by Dominicans? <laughs> I, I read a fascinating book, and uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Cookie help uh, do the science behind it. Um, Chasing New Horizons. And it was written by the, the two doctors who came up with the space probe. You know, right. Fascinating. They have a little section on there on how that vote came about. Um, then which they got Tom wrong? Tom Bo Tom Bo Tom, Tom Bo. 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 Okay. Which they got something. <laughs> we don't want to go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we have um, a few seconds, I believe. Um, if we don't if the scene isn't good tonight, we do have movie night. Uh, available, and I got some of the book, uh, The Dish, okay, the good movie. I haven't seen this one. This is called The Moon, and I don't know much about it. Um, and you mentioned that um, here's another really interesting called Invisible Threads. This was a um, uh, Kickstarter movie, and um, it's about um, Tesla, and really fascinating I think about how that whole Tesla thing came about with the German radio being placed in New Jersey and it was in New York State someplace. But it's just a fascinating story. And then, the devil and Father Amorth. You know, there, there, there's a comment there called the devil's comment, okay? So I thought, well, maybe we'll give, you know, the, the Vatican might be doing some type of diversity in equity. So we'll... <laughs> so we'll you didn't, I thought that was going to be a funny line. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay uh, I think we're ready. All right.